Welcome to Lore Evolution, the show where we look at our favourite factions, technologies and characters from the realm of science fiction and fantasy. Today we're looking at the long-standing frenemy of the United Federation of Planets, the Klingon Empire. Among Trekkies, the Klingons are a consistently popular faction with a proud mythical history, badass spaceships, and of course a signature language. But like many things in the Star Trek universe, they were quite different in their first appearance. The Klingons were first introduced in the classic original series episode Errand of Mercy, conceived of by producer Jean L. Kuhn as the main rival to the United Federation of Planets. The name for the Klingons was taken from Lieutenant Wilbur Klingon, a friend of Gene Roddenberry's while he was part of the Los Angeles Police Department. Kuhn liked the intonation in the name, so he adjusted the spelling slightly to arrive at Klingon. Flattered by the use of his name, Wilbur Klingon allegedly introduced himself as the first Klingon many years later. The main inspiration for the Klingons were the Cold War opponents of the USA, with specific visual inspiration coming from Communist China and its allies, hence the vaguely racist Fu Manchu beards. The most noticeable difference to their later appearances is, of course, the lack of forehead ridges, and the generally more human look as opposed to the more alien appearance they would later take on. This was simply a result of small budget and a lack of time. Klingon culture is also strikingly different than it is now thought of. The Klingons of the original series were scheming, brutal, and oppressive. They represented the nationalistic barbarity in contrast to the Federation's multicultural utopia. But the first appearance of the Klingons was made most memorable by the excellent John Kalikos as Klingon Commander Kor, who would later go on to play Gaius Baltar in Battlestar Galactica, and then reprise the role of Kor in Deep Space Nine. Kor is a fantastic adversary to Kirk and his crew, devious, sinister, and megalomaniacal. The episode Errand of Mercy uses the conflict between the fractions to create a classic Star Trek morality play on the futility of war itself. But unlike you'd expect, the Klingons did not become recurring villains thanks to positive, critical, or audience reception but instead because of the lower budget. While the Romulans also made multiple appearances, their makeup was much more involved, whereas the Klingons could be done extremely quickly and easily. And being the ideological opposite to the Federation, it just seemed logical for them to become the main antagonists. The Klingons would appear in a further six episodes of the original series, sometimes as peripheral baddies and other times as main villains. And while they would go on to look and sound quite different, TOS gave us the iconic D7 battlecruiser and many more memorable Klingon adversaries such as Kang, played to perfection by Michael Ansara. However, it was on the big screen where the Klingons made their first big evolutionary leap forward. Following the opening credits of Star Trek The Motion Picture, the D7 battlecruiser shows up on screen, crewed by some very different looking and sounding Klingons. With a larger budget available, makeup designer Fred Phillips and costume designer Robert Fletcher got the thumbs up from Roddenberry to go about designing a much more alien looking Klingon. During the design process, the full Klingon took shape, with the sharp teeth being added as well. The new Klingons were finally ready to go for the opening scene of the movie, with a D7 commander played by Mark Leonard, the same Mark Leonard who also played the Romulan commander commander in Balance of Terror, and famously Spock's father, Sarek. But the most noteworthy addition were the first words of the Klingon language, thought up by Scotty actor James Doohan. They were simple guttural sounds to further emphasise the brutal nature of the Klingons, but it was in the search for Spock where the Klingon language really took shape. Having extended scenes of the Klingon villain Krug, played by Back to the Future's Christopher Lloyd, led producer Harv Bennett to bring linguist Mark Okrand on board to create a working Klingon language with Doohan's sounds as a base. Okrand had already done some work in the Wrath of Khan creating the Vulcan language, but Klingon, or Klingonese as it was then called, is his most famous accomplishment. While not totally explicit in the movie, Harv Bennett, Leonard Nimoy and Okrand also made the first significant changes to Klingon culture. It was a collective idea between all three to imagine Klingon society as a kind of space feudal system, with the Klingons as samurai-like warriors. This dedication to duty is illustrated starkly when Krug kills his own lover in order to keep the secret of Genesis for himself. It was Lloyd's work in Search for Spock which really laid the groundwork for the explosion in popularity the Klingons would undergo. Although he is most famous for Doc Brown, Lloyd has often spoke highly of his time on the Search for Spock, and his fondness for the crew character as well as director Leonard Nimoy, who he got along with extremely well. Although he's more one-dimensional than Ricardo Montalban's Khan, Lloyd gives a terrific performance in the role and comfortably sits on the ever-expanding list of great Klingon bad guys. Also fun fact, one of the actors who auditioned for a Klingon in Search for Spock was none other than Robert Beltran, who would later go on to portray Chakotay in Star Trek Voyager. Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country was essentially the conclusion of the first Klingon story arc, so to speak, set up all the way back in Errand of Mercy. 
Undiscovered Country sees a wounded Klingon Empire finally making peace with the Federation after decades of hostility. Previous movies, The Voyage Home and The Final Frontier, maintain the image of the Klingons as devious enemies of the Federation, but here that multidimensionality returns. David Warner steals every scene he's in as the surprisingly wise and well-tempered Klingon Chancellor Gorkon, who is murdered in a conspiracy by those too narrow-minded and petty to see the bigger picture and the peaceful future with the Klingons the Federation risks losing. At the same time, we get yet another awesome Klingon bad guy in the form of Christopher Plummer's General Chang, who relishes shouting Shakespearean dialogue amidst the space action carnage. With the Berlin Wall coming down, Undiscovered Country returns to the Cold War allegory in finally showing the Federation and Klingons making peace with one another, something which fans had already been given the chance to see. Having created a dedicated base of Klingon fans among Trekkies, the next generation really took time exploring Klingon society and culture. Worf became a fan-favorite character as a human-adopted Klingon, and many stories saw the Enterprise crew getting tied up in the complex affairs of the Empire. It's here the ideals of space feudalism really took hold, where the Klingons taking on the visage of Bushido-like honor mixed in with a Viking sense of glory and chauvinism. While I have confessed how tired I find Klingons spouting about honor for an entire hour at times, Great episodes like Redemption cannot be overlooked. Departing the peaceful, democratic federation for a window into the Conan-esque adventures of the Klingons certainly has its appeal. But for me, Deep Space Nine is the show which really used the Klingons well. Having Worf torn between two factions amidst the impending threat of the Dominion gave the character the best material he ever had. Through Worf, we got to see the ins and outs of Klingon culture, while also being reminded just how vicious they were as enemies. And you know I love me some space battles. While the hour-long posturing sessions of TNG sometimes bored me, DS9 saw the Klingons putting their money where their mouth was, and it was great. While I am a big fan of Enterprise's latter two seasons, a consistently weak element is its portrayal of the Klingons. The potential in seeing early Klingons is pretty much squandered at every turn. They're virtually identical to the 24th century incarnations, just with more furs instead of armor, with not quite birds of prey, and not quite D7 battlecruisers. It's a little nitpicky I know, but in the TNG episode First Contact, Picard says that hostilities between the Federation and Klingon Empire spawned from a disastrous First Contact event between humans and Klingons, and yet we see nothing of the sort in Enterprise. Now it is easy to forget these things because of just how vast a franchise Star Trek is of course, but I'm sure there were far more interesting things to be done with the Klingons of this time period. But what bored me the most was the entire arc explaining why TOS Klingons don't have forehead ridges. Frankly, I do not care, and it really isn't important. TOS Klingons look different because of a small budget, but an entire writer's room bending over backwards to reconcile a superficial fan complaint just makes me roll my eyes. The Klingons have a mythic history of great deeds and battles, and in Enterprise, unfortunately, we see none of it. The Kelvin Timeline movies didn't really do a whole lot with the Klingons, which is fine I suppose, but Into Darkness gives us a nice glimpse into this alternate timeline version. Into Darkness takes the warlike nature and history of the Klingons and runs with it, turning Kronos into almost a post-apocalyptic wasteland. The Klingons themselves get a redesign here which I personally really like. Sure they don't have the Viking aesthetic, but the more streamlined armour really suits them. It's almost as if they were designed to match the D7, which the previous 2009 movie wisely kept. Not much else to say really other than I think it's a cool update of the look. But now onto the absolutely not controversial show, which I'm sure will spark no toxic debate in the comments. So, safe to say a lot of people were pissed off when the new Klingons were revealed for Star Trek Discovery. While Into Darkness certainly redesigned them, they pretty much looked the same underneath all the costumes. But Discovery went really bold with a new design to make the Klingons look even more alien. Even with the added facial ridges in the motion picture, audiences had gotten used to Klingons in Star Trek. Thus, original showrunner Brian Fuller endeavoured to make them feel truly alien again. On top of the foreheads, these new Klingons were given bigger noses with more nostrils, chin ridges folded over ears, wider chests, pronounced claws, and an elongated skull. Not to mention the elaborate and diverse costumes, weapons, and ships on display. How do we reconcile how different these Klingons look? I don't care. 
Nobody cared when they changed appearance for the movies without explanation, Enterprise contriving a reason decades later is completely uninteresting, and honestly, I just want to see what is done with the Klingons story-wise now that they look this way. Whether you like these new designs or not is up to you, but saying redesigned Klingons ruins Star Trek as a franchise is absurd. Personally, it's a mixed bag for me. Some of the ships I quite like, others I don't. Some of the costumes I like, others I don't. But what I do like about these new designs is just how diverse they are. Discovery's first and second seasons have really taken the Klingons on an interesting cultural journey. At first, the radical Takuvma rallies the Klingons into a war for the sake of preserving their cultural identity, which he perceives as under attack. But a great visual element with the Klingons in this first season, which tackles multiculturalism and nationalism because of course it would, it's Star Trek tackling relevant social and political topics aka Star Trek doing what Star Trek has always done, is that the Klingons themselves, while being one race, are incredibly diverse. The different noble houses of the Klingon Empire have previously been anonymous. They've had the same armour, the same weapons, and the same ships. But Discovery's production team really took the time to make these houses distinctive. They have their own banners, their own ship classes, their own armors and symbols. Seeing such a diverse group of people complaining about the threat of losing their Klingon identity is the perfect visual lampooning of such nationalistic rhetoric. Despite what certain people will have you believe, this visual reboot of the Klingons actually served an important purpose within the story and was in no way an attempt to dance on the grave of Gene Roddenberry or anything so ridiculous, especially because Roddenberry didn't even create the Klingons. Season 2 went even further by having a unifying element of the Empire be the construction and implementation of the D7 Battlecruiser, a fan favourite design, as the flagship in a new united Klingon navy. While I have my issues with the new look for the Klingons in Discovery, the characters within the faction and how they've developed within the story is one of the best things Discovery has done thus far. With the Discovery now catapulted to the future and Picard seeming Borg Romulan centric, there don't seem to be any significant additions to the Klingons anytime soon, but their unwavering popularity and their omnipresence within Star Trek means they are never kept away for very long. What began as a simple but enjoyable set of villains for Kirk and co has flourished into a layered and nuanced fictional race, culture and language. Whether as simple bad guys in one-off episodes or the subjects in an entire epic story arc spanning an entire season, the Klingons will always be an important part of Star Trek. Regid Donna, I'm probably going to butcher your name, asks, is the Ferengi system sustainable? No. Daniel Ahmed asks, what science fiction or fantasy novel would you like to see adapted into a TV show or movie? I've been listening to the Lost Fleet series on Audible recently, not a sponsor, and I think that could make for a terrific TV show. The way the author took light speed into account when commanding a fleet could be handled with some extremely clever editing and visuals. I also really like the tightrope of how to be a good leader the main character walks. I reckon there's plenty of good material there for a hit show. If you like my videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date with all my new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos up to a week early. Speaking of such, I'd like to give special thanks to all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.